So welcome to the Bioinformatics CRO podcast. I'm Grant Belgard and joining us today is Chris Ponting. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, Grant. Yes, my name is Chris Ponting. I'm from the University of Edinburgh. I'm the chair of medical bioinformatics here. Lovely. And and Chris was also my uh, uh, PhD supervisor many years ago and, uh, and then my, my supervisor for a second time a couple of years after that. Well, you've gone on to greater things than I have, so well done. Oh, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I just wanted to, to talk about uh, some of the things that you've, you've gotten into um, in, in recent years, especially the, uh, you know, your move to MECSF. I'd love to hear about that and what your thoughts are on um, uh, the comparisons that are being drawn to, to post-COVID syndrome. That's really interesting. And a story that really um, goes back uh, many years. So I was at university with a guy called Simon McGrath. And uh, some years later, he got ME, uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis. Um, and it destroyed his life, or at least his expectations and hope for the future. Um, I felt for many years I could do nothing about this as a scientist. Um, and then recently, uh, I was just thinking that perhaps um, the techniques of population genetics might be interesting and useful. Um, so I dipped my toe in it, and uh, eventually, after some years, some discussions, and bringing together many people from across the United Kingdom, um, we were awarded this year um, just over three million pounds to start a genetic study of myalgic uh, encephalomyelitis (ME). In the middle of that, of course, COVID comes along. It was apparent to many beforehand, and certainly more now that there are some interesting overlaps between post-COVID uh, syndrome or long COVID or whatever you want to call it, and ME. After all, um, many people with ME report a viral infection um, before they, they come down with their syndrome. Um, and this is exactly what's happening now with, with long COVID. Now, I don't wish to say that long COVID is ME. It isn't. But some people may resolve uh, from long COVID into ME, which in this country as an adult, you need to have symptoms for over four months. But what's the space, basically? I, I know some people are doing some, oh, the beginnings of some genetic studies of long COVID. Um, and it's going to be fascinating to compare the genetic signals for ME with the genetic signals for long COVID. Are they different? Are they the same? Do they overlap, but not completely, et cetera? Have, have there been any genetic studies of ME that have been broken out by the, the kind of proximal cause? So, so if, it, if it were a viral infection, uh, um, have there been genetic studies broken out by, by subtype of, of virus and so on? So you would have thought that there would be plenty of genetic studies um, and well-powered ones involving many people. And you'd think so because in this country, in the United Kingdom, around about a quarter of a million people suffer from ME. But there have not. There aren't any well-powered genetic study anywhere in the world. So we know nothing about the genetics of ME. We know that there is evidence that it is inherited, which gives us uh, some support for our case that we should do this genetic study. Um, but we know almost nothing about uh, what will eventually be seen, obviously, as being a whole set of different uh, conditions, which have different contributions made by the environment and from um, different parts of our chromosomes. It will be one of these complex disorders and teasing everything apart uh, will take time. Um, but given that there's no effective treatment for people with ME, um, we really have to start with the genetics because we know almost nothing um, as researchers in ME. And why do you think it's been so neglected? It's been uh, uh, neglected essentially because of this lack of information, um, the ignorance that uh, we as researchers have towards it. We know almost nothing. It's multi-system, which is difficult. Uh, if it was affecting only one system, then we would 
know uh, what to to do. But uh, for some people, it manifests most in you know muscles, and others in the brain, others uh, it may be perceived as an immune response problem. Many people with all all three or more. So that's a, a problem. But also, there's been a problem with its diagnosis. It's a diagnosis by exclusion, meaning that um, it's not particularly easy to diagnose. And that means that often people are not diagnosed. Um, indeed, in the United Kingdom, the time taken on average to be diagnosed is about eight years. It's neglected because we know very little. So let's start finding out, is my view. And are there are there any countries that have been ahead of others on on looking into this, or has it been very well neglected across the board? So it's neglected um, disease across the the world. There are many countries where it's not recognised at all um, by health professionals, um, and there are many health professionals across the world who think of people with ME as malingerers or who make up um, their disorder um, for whatever reason. It, it is the most devastating of diseases. It's in terms of quality of life, it's so much worse than almost everything, including many cancers and multiple sclerosis, etc. Why anyone anywhere would make up such a disorder, I just don't know. So. Uh, it, it's almost Victorian in our approach to this disease, in the sense that when we look back on this, maybe in 10, 50 years' time, we will understand what it was and look and think, why on earth did we overlook it and disbelieve all of these people for so many years? So I guess this feeds into another uh, question, which is, um, what do you think we need to do? differently in biomedical science? And there are probably many answers to this, but. So one thing is we need to listen. If we're studying a disease, then the person with disease is often the expert on it. They, they've lived the experience of the disease. If they say that it fluctuates in uh, different symptoms, that's what it is. So listening and and acting upon uh, the the experience of people. And it, it's not just their lived experience, but also they become experts in the, the literature. Um, they often, in, in my experience coming in from the outside has been that many people with ME, despite the fact that you know, they're fatigued and they have post-exertional malaise and often can't do things, even things like brushing their teeth, but they do get involved and read the literature and they are experts in it. And so I've often gone to my friend or others of people with ME and, and asked their advice as to what we should do scientifically. Um, and we should also pay attention to the fact that there are many scientists who have ME, many people who, uh, in multiple different professions who have long COVID. And uh, I, I see nowadays that uh, such uh, experience can be thought of as being negative, that somehow subjectifying their experience because it is they who are suffering um, actually is not valuable. Uh, we need to be dispassionate in our observation of disease. And actually, I don't think that's right. It's really interesting. So to, if I were to, to, to push you a little bit out on a limb and ask you to speculate, um, <laughs> what, what, what do you think we, we might learn about the disease if, if you had to um, give your best guess about, the, about ME, CSF, and um, its overlap with long COVID and so on? You don't have to answer this. But <laughs> I, so the, I don't mind answering questions uh, which are all speculative. I think as scientists, this is what we do. We, we do speculate, but in the knowledge that many things that we speculate about have no evidence for, uh, we put forward hypotheses. We 
which is a part of speculation. Um, and often we try and work out whether those are false. So one answer to your question is that I would not be at all surprised if it were to turn out that there was a mitochondrial uh, component. So as you know, the, the mitochondria is the, you know, the, the cell, the energy of, of the cell, so the battery of the cell. And, um, and if something were to go wrong with that, it would affect many different systems. It would affect the immune system. It would affect the, the nervous system. It would affect muscle, etc. And And that would make complete sense to me if that was going wrong. But I actually think it'll be many things. There have been people with ME uh, who have been diagnosed with ME who have uh, surgical operations on their neck and have uh, have many fewer uh, symptoms since then. Not a large number, a small number. And I need to say that uh, it, it is a procedure that is fraught with risk. So um, anyone thinking about it should go to their GP and their practitioner. But it is highly likely that it, there will be many different contributions made. And, and this is not easily understood. Uh, because the medical model is that if you have a, a set of symptoms, it will be one thing. But from genetics, we know that many different things can break and manifest in the same way in a person. Uh, and there are many different ways in which the clinician can be hoodwinked um, by uh, symptoms into thinking that things are one thing and they're many. So... I am willing to speculate um, on the basis of evidence, and thus far we have none. So from our genetics, we will have some, I hope, and from there we will draw up the hypotheses and hope that many of the experts in those different fields will take on the challenge of seeing whether those are false or indeed real. And can you talk a bit more about uh, your, your genetic study? Uh, when, uh, you know, the design and, and when, when you might uh, expect the results? I think the results will come in about two and a half years from now. What we will have done by then is to look at the DNA differences uh, in 20,000 people with ME in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, differences with respect to the general population. And we're very lucky in this country because we have something called the UK Biobank, where half a million people have had their DNA changes read out. And so all of that's been done. We don't need to look at those we would call controls. We only need to look at the 20,000 cases, the ME cases. Now, we had no idea how long it would take us to get to 20,000, and we haven't yet formally launched, but we have a registration page on the Decode ME webpage, uh, and 20,000 people with ME in the United Kingdom have registered uh, for this, this study, um, which is outstanding. And the work that has been put in by charities and um, digital marketing companies, etc., to get us to that point, even before we launch, is, is fabulous, which gives me confidence that really will be able to go quite fast at, in the early stages. Um, what we'll find, I don't know. May we find nothing, possibly, but we should look, and so we are. It's outstanding. What are your thoughts on how uh, communication from scientists has been handled with COVID nineteen, uh, with you know many preprints going out? I mean, there, there have been um, a number of preprints that have uh, influenced. Certainly the discussion uh, among the general public that wouldn't pass muster on review and, and, and so on. Do you think, uh, on the other hand, certainly science has moved much, much more rapidly with this than I think anything we've ever seen before uh, in, in a positive way as well. What, what are your thoughts on, on, uh, on that and on how, you know, politicians have, have kind of adopted in many cases, uh, scientists to agree with whatever uh, uh, they want to push. In, in the state of Florida, for example, our, our governor recently had a uh, kind of a, a series of conference calls with, with some scientists who had somewhat 
uh, fringe views um, uh, on on the pandemic and um, and what should be done about it. But yeah. what are your thoughts on on all that? Well, I I think it's really interesting because previously I think the public thought of scientists has been quite a homogenous bunch with the same views, um, and that's not true at all. People think of things in very different ways. And, and those kinds of controversies and conflicts uh, in ideas really have not been exposed to the general pop, pop, uh, population before. Um, but now that they are, because we're, we're seeing people on the same day writing letters to the same uh, place to say, I believe in X, and others saying, I believe in not X. And, and that has, is causing confusion, but it actually reflects the reality. Um, uh, and I think the more it is understood that there are different uh, points of view, and the more that you air them, the more people um, can uh, weigh in and give their views, um, the better. And, and that is, is happening. Um, although you, you implied that uh, peer review, which takes uh, preprints uh, into the publication domain, peer review isn't perfect. And just because it, it get published doesn't mean to say that it's correct. In, in fact, it's the, it's the goal of scientists to, to demonstrate that what was known previously uh, was either imperfect or incomplete. Uh, and and that I also, I don't think the general public uh, understood. Now, the, your, you, your question um, also makes me say that the politicians who are considering the scientists' views really are not qualified to understand the science, which is a shame. Um, why is it that scientists don't become politicians? Uh, if we had uh, a, a, a cohort of scientists who uh, members of, of different legislatures, um, then- I guess Germany does, right? <laughs> it does, it does. And, and um, they've had a very coherent uh, response to COVID. But our country in the United Kingdom, and I think in the United States is the same, uh, there are almost no scientists. Um, and, and I think that's a huge deficit uh, because you know, the, the greater expertise, the breadth of expertise there is um, in, in Parliament here, um, I think the, the better laws would be made and the better decisions would be taken. Um, at the moment, you know, we, we have the, the situation where people who have taken arts degrees, which are great, um, are taking essentially scientific decisions. And I'm not sure that that's has led to good outcomes here in the UK. So if, if you'd be willing to speculate again, um, of course the, the UK is, seems to be undergoing a second wave now, right? Where, how, how do you expect that to play out? I mean, obviously there are a lot of small decisions every day you have to make about you know, how, how you and your own family um, uh, will respond to this. I think it, it's incredibly hard for every single person to judge what they shouldn't what they shouldn't do and it's leading to a huge amount of anxiety we went to a restaurant as a family last night first time for a huge while um, but of course we were worried about that you know should we have done that are we infectious are others infectious um, should we wear masks we did um, and I unfortunately I think this is going to be the situation for a long while um, someone asked me yesterday, how long is it going to last? I mean, how do I know? I'm not an expert. I'm not a virologist and epidemiologist, but I answered. I said, I think we have another two years of this. I don't think we are going to be saved early by a vaccine or several. Um, and even so, we don't know whether a vaccine like that is going to have great e efficacy across the whole population. So the best thing to do is to try not to infect people. And people are finding this hard right. because they're used to their freedoms. They're used to traveling the world. They're used to doing X, Y, and Z. And 
hate the idea that they're being told that they can't do it anymore. But a better idea is to protect other people. And I'm an optimist that that feeling of protecting others will eventually prevail. I, I do think there's been a um, bit of a move in that direction uh, even here. Uh, I would say a few months ago was, was probably the height of people screaming at each other uh, uh, because they didn't want to wear a mask or whatever. But I think over time, people are realizing that the virus is real. And uh, if you don't, you know, certainly if you go out when sick and so on, you're, you're, you're kind of an a-hole. So. <laughs> So we had been, uh, we needed to be tested because one of the household had symptoms. And so we went to a drive-in uh, testing facility locally. Uh, and that was a sobering experience, watching the, the line of cars, watching the expense that the state uh, has put into testing so many people, getting the result back within 15 hours was amazing. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, it's unheard uh, of here. <laughs> yeah. And it's not half an hour as it is uh, at airports in Germany, et cetera. Uh, or, I mean, in Italy. Um, but that was a sobering experience, I think, for us all. And, um, and brought it home to us how widespread um, this is. Uh, that, yes, okay, maybe one in a thousand people uh, are infected at any one point. Um, but that is a huge number. What are your thoughts on, um, I, I don't know if you've looked into this much, you don't have to answer if, 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 if you haven't, uh, uh, but, but what are your thoughts on, on prevalence of, of long COVID and uh, longer term consequences? I mean, it seems uh, there are a lot of contradictory numbers about, you know, exactly how different studies are, are, are conducting surveys and, and um, uh, differences in definition and so on. This is a great example of where science actually doesn't know. Uh, it doesn't know how to define recovered for people with COVID. And if we don't know how to define people who are recovered, then we don't know how many people are ill still after however number of months. So we have to set down our structures, our frameworks, our concepts to start off with, and that's beginning to happen. And upon those uh, are new studies that are going to be determining the proportion of people uh, who are unwell still. Now, there will be people who have been in hospital um, in intensive care who will still be ill, um, and they are often going to have other conditions, um, and they will be very poorly for a long period of time. And then there are people who are going to be unwell essentially for the rest of their lives, just as people with ME are. And your question is really how, what is the proportion of people who have been infected will be affected um, with ME-like symptoms for the rest of their lives? Uh, it could be small. It could be of the order of 1%, which is, the mortality rate as well. 1% of everyone is a large number. So if it's 10%, it's 10 times that large number. And we would have in that scenario, um, a whole stratum of our society who would be unable to work, unable to look after themselves in, in many cases, a quarter of people with ME are bed bound or house bound. And if that's the case with some people with long COVID eventually, then that would be the case. It's, it's a uh, horrifying thought that that might be the case. But people with ME look upon that as, well, as something which might be an opportunity for ME to be understood, but more importantly, with a huge amount of empathy and a fellow feeling that... Um, They've always been left alone by society. And through no fault of anyone, they might be joined by, um, by large numbers of others, which will mean that society will have to pay attention, which they haven't for so long. But I haven't answered your question. Uh, your question was, what's going to be the health burden in the future? And the 
margins of error of an estimate are too large to know at the moment. I don't know. Right. Uh, yes. Yeah, speaking speaking of COVID, have you attended any any virtual conferences? I was a co-organizer of a conference over the last two days. Um, I think most people are zoomed out, um, being on Zoom or whatever calls uh, throughout the day. People, including myself, uh, by the end of the day, were just exhausted. That conference actually, however, had some energy to it. Um, we made use of breakout rooms, and that was sort of randomly done. We allowed uh, you know people to interact in ways which were less formal, and we paced it, I think, quite well. At least the feedback said so. But conferences are going to change quite clearly, and we go back to the ecological uh, case that conferences actually have not been um, very good for our, our environment for many years, and I've contributed to that. Um, so we will continue to communicate in in that way, um, virtually on on conferences, and I think that's a good thing. We will miss one another. We will miss you know the looking one another in the eye and having a beer or whatever. But you know that's a small price to pay, really, for everything else that's going on at this moment and what's already happened over the last two, few decades. Why do you think Zoom is so fatiguing? <laughs> Yeah, everyone has that that same experience. You know, you you can be at a conference all day and it's fine, but if you're on on back to back Zoom calls for three or four hours, you're 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 exhausted. <laughs> I think in a conference you can zone out. You can kind of do what aquatic mammals do and switch your brain off and sleep for not sleep. You know, we don't sleep in conferences, but you can at least. Uh, zone out yeah. for short periods of time and then come back in and focus. Uh, if you've got a bank of 20 people staring at you, you shouldn't really do that. And uh, and so you don't and you fix on what's going on. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's very tiring. Um, so at the beginning of lockdown, when, uh, you know, we had back to back Zooms throughout the day, eight or whatever a day, um, I had to change that. I had to move to uh, them being more spread out. And as winter comes here, we're going to have to organize ourselves so that we can go out in the middle of the day and actually see some sunlight um, and uh, and get some exercise. So we're going to have to plan our days differently. So um, <clears throat> I guess on a completely different, different note, um, uh, do you want to do you want to talk about your novel, or uh, will that be a, be more of a surprise? <laughs> uh, I'd forgotten. I told you about a novel. I, <laughs> I basically I finished a novel. Um, I've not sent it to anyone. Uh, the first version was read by my wife, and uh, she was rather scathing about it, probably quite correctly. So that there are now um, is a second uh, version, which is probably a bit more thoughtful and explanatory. Um, and it, it's a dystopian uh, novel. It does derive from uh, a genetic story, um, but it takes a, a whole bunch of quite broad subjects uh, from the ongoing ecological disaster that we're in um, and has a theme that I thought was not particularly topical at the time, which was viruses. Uh, but now that it's done, it's complete. Uh, viruses, of course, now are, are de rigueur. Um, and so people might think that uh, I took inspiration from the COVID pandemic, but actually it wasn't the case. The idea is that it is the human race on the earth that is the virus that is infecting our biosphere. And so many um, species that are being driven to the wall uh, by our infection uh, on the planet. It's not a particularly nice idea. It's not a particularly new idea. I, I go on to say that there's more to it than that, is that the, the men of the human race are culpable. Um, and so there is a character, I'm giving some of the plot away because it'll never be published, obviously, 
but the there's a, well, you, a you can self publish you can you can get anything out these days <laughs> i could self publish yeah yeah um there's a character a woman who who basically realizes that uh one way of um putting a handbrake on the ecological disaster was is is essentially to uh try and um hobble males of the human race and so introduces a virus to do so which targets the men only and in so doing um uh, does two things yes it hobbles the the, the males um and reduces the ecological disaster uh, but unfortunately as viruses will do what the viruses do well which is evolve and so uh, the the virus then begins to jump to other animals and to women and causes a devastating effect on the whole of the human race, um, which is only countered, I'm telling you the whole story now, uh, it's only countered by um, the introduction into the germline of uh, a mitochondrial-like entity, which, uh, um, which targets uh, the, the factors that have led the, the males to be hobbled um and basically immunizes uh some people um but these are only women uh to the effects of of this virus and so we have basically a matriarchy whereas previously we had a a, a patriarchy sounds really interesting I, I would love to read it if uh i'll yeah. give you a copy if you're interested <laughs> i haven't i i'm looking at it i'm going through it one last time at the moment mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so maybe maybe that that feeds into to one question I like to ask, which is, uh, what would you do if you weren't a scientist? I mean, would would yeah. the novelist be it or something else? It, absolutely. Um, I I've already started thinking about my next one. If I'm going to write a next one, um, I've actually enjoyed writing a lot because it is freeing. As a scientist, you have to write fact the fact is you understand them as a novelist you can write anything uh and that freedom to to venture anywhere in your mind is, is wonderful uh you're not constrained um by the evidence that's out there uh so i i really enjoyed doing that but it, it also takes quite a lot of uh rigor to do and to plot out the uh all of the different characters and the themes etc so this is what i'm doing now for what might become a second, um, which is on the theme of clonality. Uh, and the idea is that, and I haven't written a word of this, um, that a, a, a male um, clones himself thinking that he will gain immortality, but actually all that he does is introduce another male um, into the world who's much younger than him and he finds uh, to be quite a um, a challenge to his sense of superiority. Interesting, and and um, I'm guessing it's it's not in the same it's not in the same world as the first novel. It's a totally separate. No, it's a different world. Yes, which are uh, both empty of COVID nineteen. Right. <laughs> what and what, what's your process like for that? I mean, do do you? dream up all the the characters and, and the plot and so on before you start writing or is it very iterative between the writing process and the um uh, kind of picturing the world so those two processes i've i've adopted um and they're two different processes the the first was organic organic growth that just uh, percolates up in your brain and that leads to all sorts of conflict in your mind and inconsistencies in the plot line. So I had to go through the plot again and again and again to try and make it consistent. That took a long, long time. Um, so what I'm now doing is trying to ensure that the plot is, uh, is cogent, uh, well thought out, the characters are uh, three dimensional and their in interactions with one another are well described, even before the first word is written. So let's see, uh, the first way of working led to a full draft, a full version. 
Um, the second way of working hasn't yet uh, generated a single word. So let's wait to see. That's great. So what, what do you think are the most, what, what, what do you think is the most interesting thing happening in biomedical research today? Or, or, or uh, you don't have to pick one, you can pick a few. <laughs> I think the most interesting thing that's happening in, in research is how it's becoming much more immediate in its effects on the population because of COVID-19. There are researchers now who have you know, generated findings last week who have put them up as a preprint this week who will know that through the media, they will become to know, be known by millions of people tomorrow. That immediacy of effect is changing the way that researchers are, are considered by the population, by uh, governments, uh, but it's also changing the way that scientists themselves are thinking how they can do their science and how what effect and impact they have on others. A lot of science is, of course, is a lot of science is done without thinking about what is the impact, what is the benefit, uh, immediate benefit. These, these are you know, blue sky science, um, and and that's a good thing. Um, so I think hopefully once COVID blows itself out there might be an, a long lasting impact on the idea that uh, that scientists should engage more with the population, work out what are the, the issues that um, vex them most, and also uh, work on things that are, are more impactful. Um, so that to me is interesting. It's more sociological than anything. Um, what was interesting before that, of course, was the advent of, of CRISPR. Um, this idea that as scientists in model organisms from flies to mice to human cells, we could go in and edit and cut and paste and change DNA. And in that intervention asked, well, what does this letter do out of our 3 billion? What does that letter do? And really we hadn't had that ability before uh, and that that really was game changing. Almost within months, uh, everything changed in genetics. And and where do you think that's that's headed? What what do you think is um, um, what what do you think will be the most impactful thing that comes out of out of uh, CRISPR and related technologies? I think all of those technologies are now giving insights into the world of molecules that we had never had before. What do I mean? I, I mean that we've been able to observe, we've been looking at cells and molecules and watching them go by and, and prodding them and seeing what their response was, but never really have we been able to intervene directly in a very targeted manner and have alongside the edited cells, the, nor the other cells, the wild type cells, and then um, compare them one to another and, and actually see what is uh, going on. That may not seem to be a big deal, but absolutely it is. And it's taking biology, I think, one step closer to other types of interventional science, for example, in, in physics and chemistry, uh, where previously biology was much more observational. Do you think uh, we'll still be eating meat th th why, as widely as we do today in, 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 in a uh, generation? No, we won't be eating meat uh, if we're still around a generation from now. Uh, I don't believe so. There will be a proportion of our population as ever that will uh, take up a large slice of our resources of the world. Uh, but most people... I don't think we'll be eating meat in a generation. At least my vegan daughter would hope that we we don't eat as much meat then as now. And do do you think uh, CRISPR and related technologies might play a role there? I have to be careful here. I have colleagues who work in this area. Um, 
is is CRISPR going to have a, a long lasting effect on livestock? Um, it it is going to have an effect, and absolutely is being used currently to improve, as some would call it, on livestock traits. Is it going to last um, for more than a generation? I don't think so. But whatever uh, what, whatever uh, prediction I make, of course, doesn't matter because I'm just one person. And uh, once a, 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 another generation has turned, I will have shuffled off my own mortal coil. So I can say whatever I want now. And have you seen uh, what Mutable and, and, and similar companies are, are working on now? Um... It's a little bit of of, of uh, uh, genetic engineering, but um, yeah, I don't know much about this. Um, I so would... moving moving the lab grown lab grown meats to get away from uh, animal derived. My my question would be, uh, what are the resources that are required uh, to generate those lab grown meat? Um, it, it, it may be that there are issues there that would need to be, uh, you know, considered quite carefully. I mean, the, the best thing is simply not to eat meat or drink milk. I'm not a vegan, right? I'm, I'm just saying that's the best thing for our, our world mm -hmm. going forward. If everyone were to make that same decision, uh, the whole world would be such a better place. There's certainly, uh, in... I mean, I guess probably even still the very early stages of, of a, a very great extinction event. Yeah. And the, I mean, the, practically speaking, do you think it, that will, there, there's, there's, there's much chance of avoiding that or are we uh, so far along at this point? As a human race, we're not avoiding um, ecological disasters mm -hmm. at all. Uh, we're observing them and not learning from what has happened over the last few decades it it's a train crash um, that we're observing year on year. And I'm constantly reminded um, by people in my family who who say, yes, COVID is, is a huge thing, but the biggest thing, the greater thing than that is the ongoing ecological disaster. Uh, and I played my part in that. I think everyone in my generation needs to stand up and and you know, we tell exactly what we've done and then ask ourselves what we need to do in the future. This is, this is depressing, <laughs> but true, right? Um, so what, what, what do you think is your most controversial opinion uh, in science? So we have evidence that we've published that 90% of the human genome does not alter who we are and what we do. And, and that if there were to be any changes in that 90%, it wouldn't affect us at all. Many people I've talked to who are scientists who are not scientists are absolutely outraged by this idea. The scientists cannot believe that all, um, that the molecules um, that we have in all of our cells, parts of molecules, um, would not generally do anything. Um, but that, that's what the data says. I have to look at the data and um, come to a conclusion. And we've looked at the data and in a particular way that no one else has. And um, absolutely, it makes sense. It comes to that conclusion. And others using different approaches uh, come up with something uh, similar. So interestingly, we as humans would like to be sort of perfect objects where um, uh, the, you know, the, the genetic code of, uh, in our chromosomes are, are in some way um, perfect machines. It's not true at all. Um, in fact, you know, the, there is a, an evolutionary argument, which is well established, uh, that as a population, we're pretty poor at getting rid of bad mutations. Um, and so we carry them in our population and pass them down through the generations often, more often than other species. Um, so, you know, we're, we're certainly not the epitome of all animals in that respect. Uh, and, and so I, I, I think that's a really interesting view of the, of the human genome. 
Um, and not one that, as I said, every single scientist and every single member of the general public would agree with. Interesting. You've um, certainly ended up uh, in, a, in a very different place than, than, than where you grew up as a, as a child, um, you know, going to, to moving to England and then to Scotland and so on from uh, Uganda. Where, where do you think you'll retire? That's a great question. Where I'm allowed to retire by my family. Um, <laughs> Where would I like to retire? I spent two years on the west coast of Canada, um, and the countryside there, uh, the variety of countryside from um, rainforest to you know, arid desert uh, in, in just 100 miles or so, is outstanding and outstanding beauty. Um, great people, the Canadians. And I quite like that. Uh, I won't be allowed, of course. You know, we'll have many more ties, family ties inside the United Kingdom. Um, but I can always uh, you know, think of that as a dream and wonder whether that's going to happen or not. Um, England, unfortunately, I'm, I'm less fond of England than I was. So I'm not going to retire there. Politically, I think um, it, it's not a place that I recognize um as as the one that i grew up in you expect by the time you retire scotland will even still be part of the uk well uh this is a big question as to what's going to happen with with scotland um the current opinion polls are that if there were to be um uh, a referendum now yep scotland would go independent um the separation of scotland from the rest of the united kingdom would take a very long time just as the separation of the United Kingdom from the European Union, which I regret hugely, will take far longer than anyone has ever thought. And that will happen with Scotland. We share a border, um, which is, you know, you, you can not see the border. You just pass through it. It's just like a state line in the US. And uh, that would just have to change, particularly if Scotland were to become part, again, part of the European Union, which most people in Scotland would wish. Just logistically, it seems like it would be difficult for them not to. It's such a small, well, it would be such a small country. Um, it, it is a small country, it's you know, 5 million or so, but that's of similar size to other members of the European right. Union. Um, and, and such countries have benefited hugely from being part of that union. And I think sometimes we focus too much on large versus small, uh, equating them to important and not important. And um, Scotland's always been at the edges of the United Kingdom and, uh, and made much of that. Uh, and I think it might do so again. Great. Is there anything else you 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 want to want to say uh, before we we wrap up? I not really, Grant. Just it, it's a pleasure talking to you, and mm -hmm. I wish that I could ask you as many questions as you've asked me today. Um, so we should catch up separately. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I wish you well, you and your family well, obviously. Um, I don't think so. I, I I've covered quite a lot of ground, and probably some ground that um, I'm happy to to stay in, but uh, I've not covered before in politics, etc. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Hope it was a nice conversation. I've enjoyed it a lot, Grant. <laughs>